Unit 3, Review Probability. Okay, let's check out probability here. We have um, chance is considered probability, but remember, it's not predictable in the short run, but follows regular patterns in the long run. Um, obviously, if I flip a coin 10 times, it's likely that I could get maybe 7 out of 10 heads. But if I flip it 1,000 times, it's very unlikely that I can get 700 out of 1,000 heads because it's going to be very close to what the actual probability is, which is 50%. Okay, let's look at some of these definitions. Random. Random are individual outcomes that are uncertain. But there's a regular distribution over many repetitions. So over a long period of time, We call that regular distributions. Sample space is the set of all possible outcomes. So for instance, if I say, what's the outcomes, the sample space of rolling a dice? Then that's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 because those are all the possibilities that you could actually get. Okay, probability, remember this is long run, so it's long-term relative frequency. Remember, relative frequency is percentage. It's the number of times something occurs over the total number of trials. So that's my proportion. I'd put P of X equals. An event is an outcome or set of outcomes. So for instance, on the sample space, it would be rolling a five. So it'd be like five. Or roll a four or something like that. Complement. Um, remember the complement, which we put like this, a C, or we also call it P, A, hashtag, or a little um, asterisk there. And that means the um, one minus the probability of something occurring. Um, it's the event, it's the complement is the event not happening. Remember, the probability of the complement is just 1 minus the probability of it occurring. Union, we call or. We write it as A or B, or we write it as A union B. You'll need to make sure you understand both of those. In a Venn diagram, it looks like this, where it's all of A and all of B. And remember, um, this part here has been counted twice because it was counted with my A and with my B. And so you would have to make sure that you would subtract that overlap if you were adding them together. Uh, intersection is and. And you would see it as A and B. You would also see it as A intersection B. And the way I kind of try to remember this is I make that into an and symbol. And in a Venn diagram, this is just literally the overlap part right here. This is A and this is B. It's the overlap right there. Okay, disjoint events. Disjoint events uh, is um, a synonym for mutually exclusive. There are two events that cannot happen at the same time. We add together disjoint events. 
the probabilities can add because they cannot happen at the same time. So for instance, um, they look like this on my Venn diagram. There's A would be here, B would be here. We would call A and B mutually exclusive because there's no overlap. There's no events that happen at the same time. Um, Complements of events are mutually exclusive because it would be raining and not raining. Those would be mutually exclusive events. Uh, you are attending the conference and not attending the conference would be mutually exclusive. Uh, these are never independent. And then here, obviously, the probability of A and B, because there's no overlap, is just equal to zero. Okay, independent. They do not influence each other's outcomes because they're independent. So when you look at something like this, um, you see that they do overlap, but they have a special relationship with their overlap, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. There's definitely an overlap, but they don't influence each other's events. And so with independent, um, these are never disjoint because there's always an overlap. And the overlap has a special relationship, and that's this. The probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. So let's say that the probability of A, um, let's say, is 0.3, and the probability of B is, let's say, 0.4. The probability of A and B, if they're independent, is going to be 0.3 times 0.4, which is going to be 0.12. So if I were labeling this Venn diagram, I would have this here as 0.12. This here would not be 0.3. The entire one is 0.3, so this is going to be 0.18 because 0.18 plus 0.12 is equal to 0.3 because the remember, this entire A is 0.3. So similarly, for B, all of that area is 0.4, so I have to subtract here, so this is going to be 0.28 plus 0.12 is point. So this is how it would be labeled. 0.28 here. Okay, so this is only if they're independent does it have this special relationship. Um, another relationship independent events has is the probability of A given B. What this is saying is what's the probability A is going to be there given B has occurred, but because they're independent, B does not affect A, and it'll just be probability of A. Either one is... Um, fine to prove independence if you are asked to do so. All right, let's look at the addition rule. This addition rule is on your formula chart, and it's the probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. Now, obviously, you can see if it's disjoint. Let's just look at what, ha what would it be if it's disjoint. Let me just change colors. If it's disjoint, what do we know? We know that the probability of A and B is zero, so this would just be probability of A plus the probability of B, because this part is zero. If they're independent, let's look at that case. We know the probability of A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B, because, of, uh, because they're independent. So this would just be the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A times probability of B. The blue one is the general addition rule, which addition is obviously spelled incorrectly here. Um, and then the green is for disjoint, and the pink is for independent. Okay, so for conditional probability, we have the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A and B over the probability of B. And guys, this again, this is in your formula chart. So you can look in your formula chart and you can use this. This one here and this one here is in your formula chart. You don't have to memorize them. And they are also in your calculator. Uh, let's look for disjoint. So for disjoint, well, what do we know about A and B? A and B is zero. 
So it's zero over probability of B, which is obviously zero. So zero. Um, let's look if it's independent. So probability of A and B is equal to, and let me do it up here. Given B is equal to probability A and B. What do we know about that? That's if they're independent. It's the product. And then it's over probability of B, and those cancel. So obviously, this is exactly what we talked about before. But the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A if they're independent. Okay, let's look at the multiplication rule. The multiplication rule is, is, says the same thing, basically. Probability of A and B equals the probability of A given B times the probability of B. But this is just the same thing as conditional probability, except I just uh, multiplied it through. So it's the same idea. Um, but let's just go through the motions to see what do we do if it's independent. So if it's independent, um, let's do here for independent, or excuse me, for mutually exclusive or disjoint. Um, for that, remember, what do we know? A and B, we know is zero. So that's zero equals the probability of A and B times the probability of B. So everything crosses out at zero. But if it's independent, we know probability of A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B. Only if they're independent equals the probability of A given B times probability of B. Then if we do a little bit of math by dividing both sides by probability of B, those cancel. Probability of B, those cancel. And there we are again with the probability of A given, excuse me, probability of A given B is equal to probability of A. Okay, let's go to the next page to random variables. Okay, what random variables are is variables whose values are numerical outcomes of a random, random phenomenon. So it's variables whose values are numerical outcomes of a random phenomenon. Okay, so we have discrete random variables, and discrete are anything I can count. They're countable, and then we have continuous random variables, and those are infinite. Um, I can spell infinite correct. Let's try that again. There we go. And discretes um, look like, you know, if I say um, how many siblings do you have, you have one, two, three, et cetera. Continuous would be how, how tall you are, and you could be anywhere from 50 inches to 60 inches, and every single, every single um, value is, there, is accounted for. Like, you could be 50.1 to 8 four, three, two inches. So uh, that would be for random variables. Okay, so the mean of random variables, um, which is my center, by the way, if you're looking for the center of something, um, or the other word that you would be looking for, if it says expected value, that would be another aspect of it. And if you're given that, remember, that's when you're given a chart X and P of X, and let's just say this is zero, one, two, three, and the probability of this, let's just do an example, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.1. And remember, what you're going to do is you're going to multiply each of these, and then you're going to add them, add each one of them together. So 0 times 0 0.2 plus 1 times 0 0.3 all the way to 3 times 0 0.1, and that's going to be your mean. So on the AP test, I would put expected value or mean, either one would be fine, and I would put zero times 0 0.2 plus dot 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 plus three times 0 0.1, and then I would get the value, which is actually 1.4. Now, on your calculator, if you wanted to do it in a calculator, if you did it on the calculator, you would put it on the list and spreadsheet, x and px, and you'd put zero, one, two, three, and 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.1. And then you would do uh, one variable statistics. So you do menu, stats, calc. And you do one variable statistic. And you do one list. The difference is, is your X list 
is gonna be X, and then you're gonna see the frequency list, and that's gonna be whatever you labeled your P of X to be. And then you're gonna hit OK, and what you're looking for in, in your output is your X bar. Okay, and then that's going to be your, your mean. The same thing, but remember, for your work, please make sure you show how you're doing your work. So just show the first, um, the first product and the second, and the second product and the plus dot 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 in the middle to show that's how you got and got 1.4. But you are welcome to use the calculator if you would like to do that. Okay, so to define the variance, so the variance as what we're doing is really what we're doing is remember the standard deviation is just the square root of variance, but the reason it shows variance is because I cannot add my standard deviations. I only can add my variances. So here's my formula for variance, which by the way, both of the mean and the variance are both on your formula chart. So the variance is gonna be just this formula. It's every single X minus the mean squared times the probability. Now, what? Um, since I wanna do standard deviation, let's just change it just a little bit and put, okay, standard deviation equals square root of that, square root of that. So for this particular problem, this is the way I'm gonna show the work. Because it's a lot of work, I'm not gonna do it all out, but it's every single x, so my zero, one, two, three. So I'm just gonna do zero minus, minus my mean, which my mean was 1.4, squared times every probability, so times 0.2. Plus, then I would do the same thing for one and the same thing for two and the same thing for three. But I'm just going to go plus dot 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 plus, do the first one and the last one. So I'm demonstrating that I know how I'm doing it. Three times 1.4 squared times 0.2. Now, you can go ahead and do that out in your calculator or you can do exactly what I just did here. So take all of this here. Here, I'm just gonna actually, I'm gonna cheat. You can't do this, you can't copy it, but you can just say same thing, haha. -ha. But instead of x bar, I'm not looking for x bar now. Now I'm looking, going to go ahead and look for my sigma. If you look at s for standard deviation, you're going to see it says unavailable, which is great because you don't have to worry about which one do I use. But that's the one that's going to be there. So you're going to go ahead and put this data into your calculator, find out what it is, but the work is this right here. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead to look, go to a binomial random variable. Now, binomial random variable, remember, let's review what our silly little um, saying was for Mr. Bernoulli. Now, remember, that's Bernoulli trials, was sipping his tea. Now, sip was, remember, success failure, independent, and probability the same. In his geometric cup, until he realized it was piss, and his wife yelled, stop. Remember, it's stop at the first success. Remember, her name was binomial. You should see their towels. They say B and B. So stop. You're going to um, spit it out, she said. You're going to be put on trial for sipping someone else's pee. Now remember, the SPI and the PIS are the same for all of them, the same as the success failure independent probability the same. They're just in a different order because of our silly little saying, but the order really doesn't matter what, what you do it in. Probability the same. And that their trials are independent. Probability the same, independent, and then success failure. All right, so in your calculator, remember you have a binomial PDF. Sorry. And the binomial PDF in the calculator uh, is for the probability that out of, let's say, 10 people, I choose three, exactly three. Binomial CDF is the probability out of 10 people I choose between, let's say, three and seven. So there's a range. So that's the difference of binomial PDF and binomial CDF. So to be able to get to it on your calculator, it's menu, stats, distributions, and it's on that menu. 
binomial PDF is A and binomial CDF is a or B. I believe I've got the, the correct ones, but you can go ahead and go menu stat distribution. It's on your distribution menu. Um, so let's look at the formula, which by the way is on the formula chart. The for here is going to be um, it's going to be N choose K. Remember the probability of success to the K and the probability of failure to the N minus K. Remember, N choose K is just all the different ways something can occur. The probability of success to the su success and probability of failure to the failure. We have a bunch of these different practice problems here um, for, for you to do in just a bit. Okay, geometric CD, uh, random variable. So same thing, the geometric PDF is going to be here. Also the same thing, it's exactly one, so geometric. Um, PDF is going to be the probability, let's say, um, that I have a success at the third try. Geometric CDF is the probability that I have a success, you could say, by the third try, which means the first, the second, or the third, or between the third and the fifth try. Uh, so I'll put or by the third try or something like that. Any sort of combination where it's going to be like 1 less than x less than 5 or something. Anyway, any sort of here. Um, that's what your probability is. Where this one is going to be the probability of x equals 3. Like one exact one. All right, let's also, I didn't go through. And these, by the way, these formulas, which this formula is going to be the probability is going to be um, the probability of six or uh, success is going to be one time. So let's start with let's start with failure. Sorry. So my failure for geometric is going to be one minus p, which is my failure, or called q, and I'm going to call that to the k minus one, and then I have one success, and that's it. So if I had probability of x equals ten, so if this were just say probability that x equals ten. This would be to the 9, and then this would still be to the 1. Uh, and let's go ahead and see. Remember what the mean is, or the expected value for a geometric probability is 1 over p, and the standard deviation is going to be square root of q over p, which by, or remember, q is 1 minus p. And this is on your formula chart. Uh, let's go to binomial. Sorry, I didn't tell you that. The mean or expected value for binomial is np. And the standard deviation for this is square root of NPQ, all on your formula chart. Okay, let's jump to combining random variables. For combining random variables, we did go over this a little bit in our last chapter, but we're going to continue it here. So I have the mean of A plus BX. And so what you're going to do is you're just going to literally add A and you're going to multiply B. So as transforming variables, it adds for both of them. However, for variance, let's look what we have to do. Standard deviation of a plus bx is just going to be, um, it, well, this is for variance, so it's squared. It's just going to be b squared, standard deviation squared. Now, when I throw this to, when I do it to standard deviation, let's make it standard deviation. So if I do this, and it's showing you, which is just going to be B, like there. It's showing you invariance here for just a second because in, in a second here, with multiplication, it's not a big deal. I can square and find the square root. It's not a big deal. But in addition here, I have to do it in variance anyway, so that's why it's starting here. So this is for standard deviation. All right. So then let's go to the next one. So for the next one, if I have um, the mean of x plus the mean of y. So I'm just, the mean of um, Billy's money is uh, five, the mean of um, Ashish's money is seven, and I add them together, five plus seven, and that's how you do it. So it's very simple. So you just, um, I'm sorry, I wanted to write it like this because it's, but that's the same thing. Now, they have to be independent. If x and y are independent, then I can specifically say this x plus y, then I can add them. 
x plus y. Now, if I turn this into standard deviation, let's turn this into standard deviation. And what is standard deviation going to be? It's just going to be the square root. So it's going to be here, if I, let me write it out, sorry. If I have here x plus y, I'm just going to do the square root of my variance. That's why we were doing everything in terms of variance, because you have to do things in terms of variance. Now, for subtraction, let's the same thing. Let's, it doesn't have number 3 here, but let's go ahead and put a number 3 here, x minus y. That's easy. The mean of x minus mean of y, simple. For this one here, x minus y, I want you to notice that this is, I'm not messing up. This is actually the same thing. These here are identical. This is identical. All right, so the variance is going to be, um, it, you are going to add the variances, whether you add or subtract the data. If you want to see an example of that, I have lots of examples of that, and we can, I can show you. But this here is also going to be the same. So these here are the same. So I just want to make sure, I know sometimes you look and say, oh, did the professor make a mistake or something like that? But no, this is not a mistake. That's exactly what I meant, meant to be. All right, so you can see the note, adding and subtracting a constant only affects the mean. Multiplying and dividing affects both the mean and the variance, slash standard deviation, obviously. And then, of course, the variance, which we already have, is equal to the standard deviation squared. Or you can write it as standard deviation equals square root of variance. Same thing. Okay, um, now, number three, if x and y are not independent with a correlation, then we can, um, we, can do th we can do this. We have not done this in um, AP Stat, so I'm just going to quickly give those that are interested. If you're, but if you're not interested, don't worry about it. But this here is only with a correlation coefficient plus 2 rho here, here. But I want to do something for you, and then subtraction. If it's subtraction, the only thing that changes is that becomes a subtraction. Now, this whole box is not on the AP test. Most likely. Ha, ha, ha. Now, when I say most likely, if it's on there, it's going to be in an area of stretch that if you miss it, it really honestly won't affect your score. But this is going to not be on the AP test. This is just for your um, information purposes only because that's why on the flashcard, notice it says if they're not independent, it just depends on the correlation. You can't, you can't solve it. It depends on what the correlation is. So if the correlation is strong, then you're going to have a relationship. If not, you can't. So you can skip this. So yes, you can skip that part. Okay, let's remind us of the normal distribution. We did this already last week, so we're going to show you. Remember, the area is always 1 because it's 100% of the curve is shaded. That's what 1 means. The area of the curve means everything here is shaded. It's 100%, so it's, the, it's 1. The standard deviation is sigma, and the mean is mu. Um, our empirical rule, which is our 68, 95, 99, 7 rule, and that means within one standard deviation, it's 68%. Within two standard deviations, it's 95%. And when three standard deviations, it's 99.7%. So our z-score is observed minus our mean divided by our standard deviation, which is um, usually it's going to be my x value minus my mu over uh, my standard deviation, whatever that is. And a z-score, what it represents is the number of standard deviations you are away from the mean, above or below. If it's positive, then it's above the mean. And if it's negative, it's below the mean. Now, we typically say if it's so, if you have an SAT score that is 2.3 standard deviations above the mean, then that means you did better than everybody. If your SAT score is 2.3 below the mean, then you did 2.3, you did worse than the average. But if you have a race and you have a 2.3, that means you're slower. If you have negative 2.3 Z score, that means you're faster because you want, uh, you know, lower, lower, um, 
time, it means faster. Let's look at these sampling distributions. Now, remember the sampling distributions. That is when you have um, the mean now is going to be for my normal model. You have the mean is equal to mu, and the standard deviation is equal to square uh, or sigma over square root of n. So remember, that's my standard deviation. And these are all little x bars. My sampling distribution basically is made up over a bunch of means that I've had. So I have a bunch of people, and I went out and I did, and I found a um, 100 different people of size 50. And I said, OK, and I've got all these different sampling distributions, and that's and I put them in, and that's what I have. And my mean is equal to the population mean, and my standard deviation is equal to the standard deviation divided by square root of n. Um, so the mean of x bar is equal to mean, and the standard deviation of x bar is equal to this. So for proportions, now for sample proportions, so that sample mean. So, so sample proportion, remember my normal model was equal to is going to be, um, oh, sorry, I should have messed that up here. This here, I, m I messed this up, guys. Not messed it up, but I put it in the wrong spot. So this specifically wants you to put, this is equal to the standard deviation. The standard deviation means that the how far something is away from the mean. It's this standard deviation, how far something is away from the mean, this is going to be P, Q over N. Remember, Q is just 1 minus P. And so for my normal model here, this is going to be P and then PQ over N. And that's what you're doing here. And these are all little P hats. They're all just my sample proportion and finding the proportion of my sample. And that's making my sampling distribution. All right, so that's the notes. Now let's go ahead and start some actual problems. Um, and that's on my next video.